um, turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, and I want to read from verse 12. Welcome to our visitors today. Thank you for being here, uh, all the home folks as well. And those of you that are listening online, couldn't be here, we, we uh, want to send a blessing to you as well. If you would, stand with me, and we will read the word. Colossians 3, starting in verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the words that Paul wrote many years ago that we can still live by today. Just give us understanding as we look in your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. In this passage of scripture, I preached on this uh, passage a while ago, but I I felt like I didn't get in deep enough, and it's been impacting me um, since that time in some study that I've done, and I really have been blessed by these words. Paul is telling the Colossians here as the elect of God, the people back in that day clearly understood what it meant to be the elect people of God, because society at the time would have been a pagan society with many different gods, many different festivals to go to, many sacrifices to make. You know, so if there wasn't rain, uh, the elect officials or people of that religion would go around and find out if you had made your sacrifice. Did you make the proper sacrifice that there's a drought happening? Were you doing the right spiritual things? And, and these people in Colossians and in the Roman world, there were many, many false gods. And there were many religious traditions that people were doing to these gods so they would stay happy. Now, think about it. Here comes Christianity into this world of many gods and many traditions and people stopped doing this stuff. What do you think happened in these communities? Well, immediately as bad things began to happen, who got the blame? It was the Christians. Because they wouldn't go to the festivals anymore. They wouldn't participate. So Paul does a great job in the book of Colossians to lay out who Christ is in the beginning of the book. And to describe why we follow him, why we turn to him and who he is in all the religions. If you look back at chapter 1, it says in verse 17, he's before all things and by him all things consist. So it's like all these other pagan gods and festivals were diminished in light of Christ. So let's look down. The first point I have is called putting on God's attitudes. So Paul says, put on therefore, and then we're going to skip the next phrase, and I'm going to come back to that later. Uh, the next phrase is, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. But I want to skip that right now, and I want to just look at put on therefore. The next phrase is bowels of mercy. Paul asks us to have this intense experience of compassion. Now, how many of you young people had compassion for those children 
before you took this trip? Did anybody here have compassion for the children of Phoenix before you took the trip? How many of you, after seeing where they lived, have compassion for the children of Phoenix? Raise your hands. If you look around, you'll see most of the young people that were out there, all the young people that were out there, raise their hands. Do you see what's happened here? You've experienced life with the children from Phoenix. You understand where they come from, and your heart went out to them. Paul is saying, as a Christian, we're to put on this kind of attitude about the people around us. You know, last Sunday I had to make a confession that the, there was a homeless person that I had kind of a bad attitude at. If, if you would have had that attitude towards the homeless that came to get the food there, what would have happened? You know, and I, I had to repent of it and confess it because I, I didn't have these bowels of mercy for, for this person. But God wants us to put that attitude on to understand what other people are going through because the church is supposed to be the place. God loves these people. He loves us. He has provided for us. And he wants us to provide for those who have less. We are to be moved by what God is moved by. God is moved by the condition of those who don't know Christ. That's what he's moved by. He gave his son for the whole world because his compassion for those who would be lost. We're also to be moved by the orphan and the fatherless and the widow. You know, folks, I just want to put out a word. Um, One of the things that I've experienced since my dad passed away is the reality of what it's like for a widow and for what it means for people to visit. And I know that I am not great at this. I'm learning and trying to get better at visiting people from the church. But how many times do you visit those in our church who are elderly? How many times do you just go stop in for uh, 10 minutes? What did Brother Roy used to say? 10 minutes is much better than two hours. You know, it's, sometimes we think we have to have a lot of time to go. But stop in for 10 minutes. Encourage, visit with people. I just, I would like to put a plug out. You know, people who are in the elder stage of their life, they bring something to us. I'm getting there too. The other day my ankle was hurting so bad, I was limping around. It's like, man, what's going on here? I'm getting old. Um, And you start realizing, you know, the day comes when, when there's aches and pains. But I would like to encourage our church to not forget those who are not getting out and who can't get out. Let's visit them. Make a difference. The next thing that he says we're to put on is kindness. This is the Greek word Philadelphia. Well, you say, well, that's... Philadelphia, the city. No, it's the word is brotherly love. That's what the city was named after. We are to have love for the brotherhood. Our brothers and sisters around us is who we need to care for first. And then brothers and sisters around the world. And I I am blessed by this church and the outpouring of um, the outpouring that was given in in response to needs in the church. I just want to bless this church for the heart that we have for each other. God so richly touched me when we had that offering, the response that was here. And and that's something that we, we just need to treasure and thank the Lord for. But what about our brothers and sisters around the world? You know, one of the things that's happening right now is Ukraine is getting a lot of attention because it is terrible what's happening over there. 
But the greater global results of this are going to be ca catastrophic as well. Somalia has been in three years of severe drought. Many, many of the villages, all the cattle have died. There are no cattle left in many villages of which people relied on for milk, uh, for food sources, and people have had to go gather in refugee camps. And Ukraine was one place that grain was bought from for Somalia. And it, with the war going on in Ukraine, it looks like there's going to be an even greater shortage of grain in the country of Somalia. So what's going on in the world today? Do, does our heart move with compassion? Are we moved to help? our brothers and sisters across the world too. We have been given so much. And I believe we'll be held accountable for what we have. And the gifts that we have, whether it's you having a gift of serving or maybe you, a spiritual gift, that gift isn't for you. If it's financial gift, that's not just for you. It's for you to bless the world. And for me, for us, we have been given these things so that we become avenues and blessings. The attitude of God, kindness. The next attitude he talks about is the humbleness of mind. Simply means to be of a humble mind. Lowliness. You know, able to be taught. If you meet somebody that knows everything, it's very difficult to teach them anything. Sometimes... Um, when you turn 16, that's kind of your position. Uh, I was a little bit like that. I'm not saying there's any 16-year-olds here that are like that. But it can happen. Uh, I've seen this before. Very, very difficult to teach someone something that knows everything. And this attitude here that God is asking us to put on is that we have the attitude that we can be taught. You know, whether you're the oldest person here or the youngest, there's always something to learn. There is always something that we can learn. And are we willing to be taught? To learn properly, we must admit we don't know something. And then the difficult thing about learning something as you get older is you're supposed to know it. So then when you act like you know it, the truth is you will never know it because you won't be able to learn. And the reality is when you learn something, you often have to feel a little bit foolish about what you didn't know before. So that brings us to meekness. Do you have a meek attitude? Commentator David Guzik said it this way. Meekness is that attribute that makes that I will not dominate, manipulate, or coerce for my own way, even if I have the power to do so. You think about that statement that David Guzik made. I will not dominate. I will not manipulate, I will not coerce for my own way, even if I have that power. Maybe you're in a position where you can get what you want, whatever means that you want, or maybe we could respond like that, but meekness says, no, I won't do that. I'm going to look out for someone else. The next attitude that he asks us to put on is long-suffering. The ability to endure for a length of time under less than favorable conditions or attitudes from others. Yeah. Any youth feel like you had to be long-suffering on the trip? Yeah. You find out that not everybody functions exactly the same way. And that we weren't all meant to sleep in the same room. Right? But... God is good, and we have to bear with each other. You know, there are some of you in this congregation that are suffering every day from a physical ailment. 
Maybe some of you are suffering from a relationship that is not right in your life and you've done everything you can to try to get that relationship right and you're discouraged about it. Maybe you have tried everything you know in your power and still that relationship isn't what you want it to be. Continue. Simply put, don't stop. God is faithful. His glory is revealed in us when we are able to continue being faithful even if we're not healed. And that's difficult to hear sometimes. But sometimes His glory is more revealed in the faithfulness of the Christian. You think of the story of Job. God said, have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered my servant sitting in that pew at Bethel? Life isn't great for them. But they keep going every day. And they glorify me despite what they have going in their life. Long-suffering. The next one is to forbear and to forgive one another. And I've used the youth a couple times already. But, you know, to, sometimes when you live really close to each other, in family or wherever. We have to forbear with each other, the body of Christ. We're not all going to do things the same way. Someone's going to offend us at times, say things that hurt us. What are we going to do? Are we going to hold that as a grudge? Or are we going to forgive? You know, forgiveness frees us. And that's the beauty of of forgiveness. Above all these, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Now, I have a little example here. One of my favorite things in life is fresh, hot chocolate chip cookies with a cup of coffee. And I'm not going to try to bake them here, but I need a couple volunteers, maybe a couple girls to come up here. Do I have two girls, young girls that would come up and help me? We'll put it down here. We're going to play a little bit. Okay, I have two containers. And in these containers is basically everything it takes to make chocolate chip cookies. But I have a question of which one you want to eat. Can I get someone to come up and dip some out for me? Maybe if the girls don't want to. Grace, would you want to come? Okay. All right. Any young men that would like to be a chef? Come on. John Eric. All right. We're going to make cookies. Do you want to dip out? Dip this out. Let's see how many people would eat this cookie. All right. Okay. Okay. Okay, put it on there. We're going to make a cookie out of that. Do you think your mom would bake cookies that look like that? No. What? He doesn't agree with me. Okay. All right, now get one out of there and see if your mom would make cookies like that. Squeeze the handle. There we go. Okay, good job. All right. You can put it back in there. All right. Now, which one do you think you want to eat after it's baked? You'd like to eat that one. Anybody think you picked the right one? Okay. Do you see the one? Thank you very much. You can go back. See, right here, I have basically all the ingredients except butter. Love. <laughs> More to love, right? <laughs> uh, and there's a few other things that hold this together. But the fact is, the dry ingredients are all there. Everything is there. But just like there needs to be a component that holds it all together and allows it to bake. And that's exactly what the Paul is saying that love is. Love is putting all these other attitudes together. That in the end, when this tray comes out of the oven and I sneak through the kitchen, 
I'm going to have a treat. So there's more dough at home that'll, <laughs> that's not like this. So thank you, John Eric, for helping us. So the truth is that we can have all these other attributes, but love is called the bond of perfectness. It's what brings it all together. The second point I have today, the first one is putting on God's attitudes. The second point is accepting our position with God. And we're going to go back to that phrase, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. That's our position. God has elected us. The Greek word for elect is electos, meaning to be especially of especially high rank in administrative association with God or as his messenger to human beings. Now the truth is, he did not just say that the preacher's bench is the elect of God. But listen to what he says it means to be the elect of God. Chosen to be especially high rank in administrative association or as his messengers to human beings. That's each one of us, folks. As his messengers to human beings. You know, we have a role. When I was a little boy, my dad was loading pigs, and I was very, very young. And for lack of better help, he selected me to stand in a position so the pigs had to come out of the pig pen turn when they saw me I was supposed to stand there and at the sight of me they were supposed to turn and head for the barn now if you know pigs or have ever worked with pigs this is a very highly unlikely scenario to work I'm not sure what my dad was thinking that day <laughs> Okay, I think I was maybe four years old. It's one of my first memories. Well, I stood in that position until the pigs came out of the pig pen. At the point, they looked like Godzilla or something <laughs> in nature. And I dropped whatever I was holding and ran as hard as I could for the house left my position, and hid behind the couch. Needless to say, the pigs didn't go where they were supposed to, and it took a while to get them in. Now, sometimes you may feel like God asks you to do something that is much greater than what you can ever imagine doing. But he's with us. It's like the little boy I heard a preacher say last night. Like the little boy that uh, was always scared to go to the pantry to get something. And his mom said, you don't have to worry. I know it's dark in there, but Jesus is already there. And finally, after a few minutes, mom got him convinced to go over. He goes over, opens the pantry door and says, hey, Jesus, hand me a can of tomato soup. <laughs> he wasn't going in there. But the position we've been given is that we have been called. We are to spread the word. We're not just trophies on Christ's shelf, polished and sitting there. He actually has a plan for each one of us to spread the good news. The kingdom of God is here, and it's coming. Revelation talks about the new Jerusalem came down. And there was a new heaven and a new earth. I don't know what that's going to be like, but I'm pretty excited about that day. Now the temple of God is with man, and God's going to dwell with man and be with him and be his God. Revelation 21. The new Jerusalem. It doesn't stay in heaven. John saw it coming down out of heaven onto earth, the new earth. And now God dwells with man. It's his vision, his goal. 
And what are we doing to be part of that? You know, the job we have to be holy, the next part is holy. It means to be separated from, separated from sin, separated from the influence of the world, free from defilement, characteristically godlike. I can't accomplish that. I'm constantly coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, make me holy. I confess this in my life. We're not perfect, but thank God for a Savior, Jesus Christ, who redeems us and restores us. Beloved is the other condition that we have. God loves his children, and we can accept that fact. Sometimes we struggle with this fact, and we have a hard time loving ourselves as God made us. You know, when you think of a dad coming home, a lot of you young dads probably experience this. You come home from work and there's a child running down the hallway or running outside to jump in your arms. Do you push him away? No. What do you do? You get down and you open your arms and you let him jump. Many of you have probably spent time on your hands and knees giving horse rides, sore knees and all through the house. That's a picture of our God. When you come running to him, he's not going to push. He's going to open his arms the same way you do as a dad when you come home from work. The third point I have is the practices of people who have his attitudes and accept his position. So you think about it. We have these attitudes we accept this position. We know that we are part of something. We're holy. We're beloved. And now we can practice. The next part says in verse 15, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Peace in the heart is the thing that keeps us steady in life. Large ships have ballast in the either at the stern or the bow or down in the bottom. When a cargo ship heads for sea with all its fuel and they begin to use up the fuel, they become lighter. And if they're not weighted properly, that ship will toss in the storm. If you took all the cargo out, it would just be like a bobber on top of the ocean. So they have tanks that they fill with water to weight the ship down, to keep it in the perfect condition, no matter what the weather around it. And I think that's a picture of what peace is in our life. It's that perfect condition of our soul that we can weather any storm. And the only place we can get that is from Jesus. We are called to this steadiness and peace in the body of Christ when we understand and we're to be thankful. We're supposed to come to the body understanding how we fit and what we bring. Do you know that you bring something to the body of Christ that no one else in this room can bring? And when it's not brought, then this church is missing it. So the gift you have and what you bring, let it be part of it. The next part is that we are to let the word of God dwell in us richly in all wisdom. So since I was on cookies, I was trying to think of an example of something that would exemplify dwelling in you richly. And the only thing I could think of was a cream stick. This was late at night last night. And I had cookies on my mind and then the cream stick came. Well, I had to think about the fact that it, when the word of God dwells in you richly, if you get a cream stick that is a full of rich cream and you take a bite in it, there's going to be cream on the side of your face. It's going to be on your hands. It's going to come out everywhere. It's going to drop on the floor. It's going to just exude out of that. Now, the opposite of true, if you ever split a cream stick with someone and you get the dry end, you can understand why you want the rich one. But I think we're like that to the world. When people interact with us, do they sense that there is a richness of the word of God in us? Brother Roy, 
Mast, Brother Eli Yoder. We've lost them in the last couple of years. But when I think of the word of God dwelling in you richly, I think of men like that who could stand up and quote verses. Does the word of God dwell in us richly? Because you know what we're supposed to do with it? The next part is we're to admonish one another. And I'd like to take a moment and just do that today. I would like for all of you to open your Bibles to Psalms. I'm not going to make you stand up and sing. It says here you're supposed to Admonish one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. We're not going to make anyone stand up here and sing a solo. It says we're supposed to do that, but you don't have to do that today. But I want you to get the psalms out, and for closing today, we're going to close with this. I want us to open the Word of God and be obedient to the Scripture today. And I want you to take a moment and look in the Psalms. And ushers, if you can get the mics for us, I would like to take a few minutes here, I know it's time to close, but I think we have time for this, to share some Psalms that encourage you. Because it's not just across the pulpit that you're to be encouraged when you're together in the body of Christ. We're to be encouraged through each other. So, let's just pause for a word of prayer and then we'll, we'll open it up. And if you have a psalm that you want to share, a verse from psalm, we're going to just take a few minutes and admonish each other and, and uh, share with each other. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for the blessing of your word. And how we can have the word of God dwell in us. And it's not just there for us. It's there for us to encourage and admonish and to keep on and to bring people into the light of your kingdom. We thank you that we have this gift of the word of God. Help us to have your attitudes. Just pray a blessing.